timer, 15 minutes. Okay, she said done. I agree with all the tools that we've just discussed, but I'm a prosecutor all my life. And as they say, when you're the hammer, all you see is nails. So I truly believe that unless you have, if not the end of, at least a serious mitigation and ameliorization of impunity through the national system in the country at which you are, the host country, all these great ideas and reporting and the ways to control money flows that go through the banks are not going to work. Why? Because sitting in a jail cell, when you got to share a toilet with a lot of other guys and they're watching, is a great leveler and a great deterrence. And I do believe that we need to have an effective justice response to these folks who are doing this. And on page six, it gives a sort of rough summary, but I wanted to cover a couple things. Uh, number one, let's not forget Sachs O Cash. I spent 10 years in Afghanistan, eight in the Balkans. And the Washington Post, New York Times reported sacks o cash with millions of dollars in each sack. They were big damn sacks. Being carried into Cam Air or later Safi Air and flown out. And you know what? They listed it. I'm taking more than 10,000. Bye. And they went to Dubai and Turkey and other places. And that means you're not going to stop them because it doesn't go through New York, their actual physical cash. Second of all, we need to remember that there are other solutions within country that work very well. If you go back to the UN Convention Against Corruption and look at Article 6 at that oversight body that deals with de deterrence well, not deals with criminal deterrence, rather, but deals with prevention and deals with oversight. What do you have? You have administrative type of reforms. And if you look at Afghanistan, one of the big successes has been the National Procurement Commission, which has stopped uh, millions of dollars from being uh, given away through corruption because they looked at the contract system, and indeed, Cigar was one of the very first uh, to do an investigation, give that information, and cancel a contract. So those sort of preventative administrative mechanisms within country, which are not putting people in jail, work very, very well. Still, you need something more. And what you need is the criminal justice system to work and put people into prison. Now, what are the problems? Number one, the problem is, first of all, we tend to do things too late. Look at Bosnia. You heard some examples in terms of law enforcement. Let me tell you, it wasn't until 1998 before we got the idea, you know, we're working with the police but we have no idea what's going on in the Bosnian courts. And it took the Swedes, when they were president of the Security Council, to get through a, a Security Council resolution that set up an assessment program in the judiciary. I was part of that along with a lot of other people that looked at the courts and started monitoring and working with them. If you look at Kosovo, it was worse because that's when Kosovo had the UN take over the government function, proving, I guess I could say, that the UN is no better or worse than any other government, given all the mistakes that the UN made. Ask the UN to show you the lessons learned document that a lot of us participated in in, in 2008, because USIP and others did a great job putting it together. And then if you remember Raiders of the Lost Ark, 
Remember that big giant warehouse where they put the Ark of the Covenant that also has that report? They buried it, and no one has a chance to see it because there were a lot of mistakes made. One of the mistakes was the UN police came in with executive powers as police in 1999, June. But someone had the brilliant idea, we don't need to deal with the judiciary. The, the now Albanian Kosovar judges and prosecutors lets them take what the police give them. And before police primacy made them law enforcement, you had K4 doing the law enforcement. And I remember going to a conference and listening to a lieutenant who looked like he came out of the bridge over the River Kwai with the mustache and everything else, the Alec Guinness look. And he said he and his men had seen with their own eyes three Albanian Kosovars throw two grenades into a Serb farming family's backyard trying to blow up the family. They picked them up. They gave them to the Albanian Kosovar judge. Then they saw them a half hour later at a Burek stand someplace, and they were out. And therefore, K4 had to start its own, I don't want to say illegal, novel detention regime because they couldn't trust the judiciary. That's what happened until 2000 uh, February, where the first international prosecutor and the first international judge were brought in by the UN. We ended up having about 12 or 14 of both because the lesson learned was there's a continuum and the continuum starts with the police and goes through to corrections. And you need to have the entire continuum trustworthy and not have biases and not have prejudices. And that's what happened there. Now, it was in stutter steps that it was finally fixed. Why? Because the UN wanted to do things incrementally. So for the judges, the first thing they did is said, look, we don't want to be in charge of the judiciary. That is bad optics. So what we'll do is there are three judges, used to be actually five, two lay, three lay and two professional on a Kosovar court. What we'll do is put one UN judge in there. And that judge will sort of be like, and this is before it had other meanings and uses. I use this in a special report for USIP. It's like a tea bag. And they figured, we'll take the tea bag, we'll put it in, we'll dip it through that neutrality and international goodness and flavor will just seep through the rest of the tea that has a little problem and the other four judges will see you can't say your prejudice when you have a judge from the UN there and what happened there were a hell of a lot of 4-1 decisions with the one being the UN judge Seriously, I know this because he wasn't supposed to tell me, but my roommate, the Swedish judge, uh, told me. And what was more frustrating is the system didn't allow dissenting opinions. So therefore, when it was a four to one to let the Albanian liberation heroes go or the not so guilty, actually innocent Serb get convicted, it would be reported as judicial system with international judge agree, Serb is guilty, agree, liberation hero is innocent, okay? So finally they figured out we need to have majority rules international. And that change was made by the SRSG who had the power to make legislation. And so it wasn't until that happened that we had actually the right and I, by that I mean just results, in my opinion, happening. That still wasn't enough. Why? Because it wasn't a court. It was simply the judges and prosecutors selecting cases and going and sitting on them. And the problem with that is the UN decided to play politics like any other government. 
So what happened was, instead of having a mandate that said, these are the priorities that we need to fix, the SRSG took the flavor of the month and assigned particular cases based on what would be good politically. You know, people aren't paying their electric bill, so therefore, Michael, I actually found this out because they sent me an email and forgot to cut off the bottom part, and I got to read all that. Uh, we need to do something about people not paying their electric bills, have one of our prosecutors find a case, don't settle the case, take it to trial, get a maximum sentence, we'll publicize that. Really, it said that at the bottom of the email. And as a result, we can do something about people not paying electricity. That is not the way to run a justice system. And that is why the Kosovo model should not be used for what the argument here is, which is we should have hybrid courts. Bosnia did a pretty good job of having them. Uh, Kosovo, like I said, didn't have actually a hybrid court. Uh, in Afghanistan, we could have had a hybrid court. And by hybrid, I mean national and, nas and international judges national and international prosecutors working together, but the control has to be the internationals. Do you know that in 2004 and 5, when the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission did a 3,000 Afghan poll about people who wanted justice because of all the human rights violations, the gross ones, that took place through all the regimes, the communist regime, the Mujahideen, all the rest, the people said, we do not want to trust our own judiciary. The people said of Afghanistan, 77% wanted either only international judges and prosecutors to make the decisions, or they wanted a mix. Only 22% wanted to trust their own. Now, what happened? What happened is Mr. Brahimi, who was the SRSG, the first one, Ironically, after writing a beautiful report, Mr. Brahimi uh, changed his mind and decided he and the powers that be with him all wanted a light footprint. So they did not want to try to do anything like the hybrid court that they could have had in Afghanistan. Therefore, we've been playing catch up. Read Sarah Che's chapter. Uh, on Afghanistan as to what happened in 2009 to 11 on anti-corruption in her book, Thieves of State. I don't need to repeat it here. It's a great chapter. And it shows you what happened when you overstretch by, uh, by bagging the CIA's bagman, who was also uh, President uh, Karzai's uh, special aide. And Karzai then destroyed what uh, Gordon Brown and Hillary had set up in 2009, which was an Afghan-only corruption, anti-corruption unit and anti-corruption court. Now, I just came back from in 2016, another chance where we have the anti-corruption justice center. Is that working now? Yes, it is, and slowly. However, what is the danger? The danger is you have President Ghani, who actually is trying to do something and so far looks good, and with him you have a brand new attorney general who is not corrupt like the other one, who the word is took over $10 million with him back to Germany. He was a dual citizen. So the problem with saying even now it looks pretty good is because a change in administration can mean it's not going to work. If you look at, and I have to say it, CICIG, as uh, in uh, Guatemala, as well as the ECCC, the Cambodia, sorry, the Cambodia War Crimes Court, those are hybrid courts done by treaty between the UN and the country. So you do not necessarily have to use Chapter 7 and UN Security Council resolutions to have a hybrid court. CAR is now working on a hybrid court with the internationals in the majority learning from the mistake in Cambodia. UNMIS also has that possibility uh, in South Sudan. It is essential that we use the conditionality and most important, use the power of the money next time there is an intervention, and to make sure that at the beginning, not in the end, 
you have a hybrid court. It also gives victims a voice. It gives them a chance to be part of the case, to get compensation and to get reparations. And last of all, I will say that famous word as my wrist and Siri buzzes me, uh, which is you can't have peace without justice. That's not really true. Let me put it this way. If you don't have justice, whatever ceasefire or temporary peace you have will soon collapse because as in Afghanistan, notice this long ending sentence, I figure if I don't have a period at the end, I can keep on going. Uh, you can make sure that you get rid of the spoilers, or at least enough of them, to reduce the corruption so the population and the people have some faith in the government and are not going to go out of their way trying to support the anti-government elements. Thank you. And I've asked, oh, you did it. Hey, you're great. Okay, thank you very much. 20 bucks for you, because I didn't have a PowerPoint, so I asked him to put this up. If I can help you with any information on this, uh, write me, uh, and I'm happy to get in touch with you. I do.